Today we will learn and reflect on the commandment Do Not Envy, which is covered in the book by Dr. Laura and her rabbi. This book has much practical advice on how to live a godly life in the modern world. A little over a decade ago, Dr. Laura had a morning national radio show for married moms who stayed at home to take care of their kids. Dr. Laura is unique. When anyone complained about their marriage, she actually suggested that maybe their marriage will work if they'll first be nice and act like a loving spouse would. Now, of course, this doesn't always work, especially if there's physical abuse, which should never be tolerated. But this is certainly a solution that should be tried first. And it's not tried too often, I might add. Now, regarding the commandment, do not envy. What is man's most primal urge? And that is, I want, I want, I want. And not maybe okay to want, but to want way too much. To want in excess, that can be spiritually dangerous. Our Dr. Laura and her rabbi, Stuart Vogel, have a unique perspective. And Dr. Laura and her viewers have interesting observations on envy in each of the Ten Commandments from the year she's been hosting her show, which was on national radio, but for the past decade or so has been on Sirius XM in the internet. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video and the additional lessons we can learn from these sources and my blogs that cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. If in your heart you keep shouting, I want, I want, I want, not only are you acting and living like a child, but when you focus excessively on getting more possessions and success, then you risk becoming obsessed and possessed by jealousy and envy. Coveting and envy is a sin that is unique because it is a sin of our thoughts and minds, our thoughts, desires, and feelings. Dr. Laura notes that wanting by itself can be motivating, that ambition is needed for striving for accomplishments and a career, but as the Greeks warn us, nothing to excess. We should never want something at someone else's expense. She quotes Dr. Robert Koffel, we are exhorted to push evil thoughts from our minds and by replacing them with good, uplifting thoughts. Dr. Laura and her rabbi say, when we do not set limits on ourselves, when we lose the sense that the ultimate good of acts or things resides in their service to godliness, when we lose that sense, the world becomes too small and limited to satisfy our infinite yearnings. The life of the envious is a life of torment for the perpetually unsatisfied, and is a dangerous world for others who stand in their way of their striving for success. When thinking about the best illustration for these comments by Dr. Laura, what can be better than the covers of the best-known self-help, salesmanship, and prosperity gospel books that have so profoundly affected our culture? These books both provide you the skills needed to be successful in business and in sales, but what is not often discussed is the spiritual dangers of wrapping our lives around our personal success, which often leads to the sin of envy when we're jealous of the success of our neighbors. The power of positive thinking? Does the Bible, the church fathers, or the moral philosophers say that anywhere? How to win friends and influence people? Is this Christian minister trying to tell us how to manipulate our neighbor for our own selfish gain? When we allow our culture to encourage us to live selfishly for ourselves, when we worry anxiously about the size of our own bank account and standard of living, when we reject living a selfless life, then we stray from the twofold love of God in our neighbor, and we truly stray from our own salvation. We do not want to proclaim greed is good, as in the famous or infamous movie. And we're talking about the movie speech and the Wolf of Wall Street. Greed, for the lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its form, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. Now it's desire the same as coveting. Dr. Laura and a rabbi point out the version of the Decalogue in Deuteronomy uses two words for coveting, exhorting that you should not covet your neighbor's wife, followed by you shall not desire your neighbor's house. Now scholars differ on this question, but the verse in Micah 2 suggests that desire itself is a sin. They shall covet fields and take them by violence. Other scriptures exhort us not to sin in our thoughts. In James, you want something and you lack it, so you kill for it. And in Proverbs, jealousy inflames the husband who will show no mercy when the day comes for revenge. The life of the body is a tranquil heart, but envy is a cancer in the bones. 
Notice how we chose the painting of a marauding Viking ship as the icon of envy. But in the next picture, we include a picture of the winning coach Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers and a picture of the Enron Corporation. And this picture of Enron is really a picture of a modern version of corporate piracy, where corporations only exist for the enrichment of upper management with no consideration for the customers, employees, or American society. And this selfishness is a credo of too many of the modern economists. For example, Milton Friedman, the prominent school of Chicago economist, actually encourages the greed is good, selfish attitude when he states that a large corporation's sole mission is to make as much money as possible for its shareholders, that a large corporation has no obligation to society as a whole. And I presume this also means it has no obligations really to its employees other than to pay them a wage. Maybe there is a reason why it is common for companies large and small in America to refer to employees as human resources. Dr. Laura shares some interesting stories. She remembers when one caller was envious of her friend's new great job. Dr. Laura suggested that she throw a congratulations party for her friend or send her a note sending congratulations to ward off the temptation to envy. Another caller recalls, I think envy has gotten the best of me when I've forgotten my purpose. I'm here to make a difference in the world and not to compete for glory. And another caller recalls, greed or envy only gets the best of me when I'm competing in a sport. So perhaps maybe Coach Lombardi's saying is not at all that wise when he says, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. On a more positive note, let's discuss a story about the right type of success and the right type of winning. We did a video on the winning University of Colorado coach McCartney, who retired at the height of his winning career to dedicate his life to a ministry he founded called Promise Keepers. A ministry that has had limited success because he was trying to spread a rather unpopular message of racial reconciliation. A message that he thought important since he came to understand how difficult life was for the families of the many black high school football players he recruited. So how does this relate to envy? Many early church fathers viewed generosity to the poor and almsgiving as a spiritual antidote to the temptation of envy. And one prime example of that is the work of the Shepherd of Hermas. Another caller says that someone who does not covet is a person at peace, a person content, a person happy with their present circumstances. Her Rabbi Vogel quotes the rabbinic teaching, who is wealthy, the one who is content with his life. And, of course, we have the picture here of the book of Ecclesiastes, as in which the old and meditating King Solomon contemplates, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In other words, we should value heavenly treasure over earthly treasure. Dr. Laura corrects misconceptions of many of her callers. Contentment with our blessings is not laziness. Contentment does not imply a lack of effort or ambition. Instead, contentment is appreciation and gratitude, and not an inventory of what is missing or what is yet to be gotten. You know you are on the right track when you can enjoy the success and happiness of others. You are on the wrong track when, instead of admiration and respect for the success of others, you instead suffer from resentment and an enraged sense of entitlement. Dr. Laura also has a long discussion by a caller on how having both spouses work can be a subtle form of coveting, and that can be true when the family can live on the earnings of a husband alone if they cut back, or at least until the kids get into school. But single mothers are usually compelled to go to work, and there are couples who make so little that they really are both forced to work. And in my humble opinion, we should not be too judgmental on this. This is a private decision between them and Jesus. One biblical story that Dr. Laura and the Catholic Catechism mentions is that of King Ahab, who envied the orchard of Naboth, who refused to sell it to him, preferring to keep it in his family. His evil wife Jezebel, worshipper of the pagan god Baal, the Canaanite daughter of the king of Tyre, upset that her husband Ahab was depressed, framed Naboth on false charges of blasphemy, executing him, and stealing his orchard to make her husband happy. And this reminds us that the sin of envy is a gateway sin that often leads to slander, theft, and sometimes murder. Dr. Laura also recounts the biblical story of David and Bathsheba. One day when his army was off to war under his trusted general, David lingered in Jerusalem when from his palace he spied on Bathsheba bathing on her rooftop. And as we all know, what kings want, kings grab. 
This envy of David led to adultery, theft, and the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And you can see David in this picture peering from his palace roof at Bathsheba. Both of these Bible stories are also mentioned in the Catholic Catechism under the commandment, Do Not Envy, so we included more details in that video. And we're planning some more videos on the commentary on these two stories. However, Dr. Laura has this odd observation that right coveting, that is, growing in spirit, wisdom, knowledge, and goodness, does not take from nor diminish anyone else, but instead benefits each of us and the world. Now, this is better described in the Beatitudes exhorted by Jesus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. My criticism is not Dr. Laura's observation itself, but rather the phrase, right coveting is spiritually hazards, as it is too easily misunderstood, because this is the only place I've seen this usage of the word coveting, which suggests that, it, yes, it can sometimes be virtuous. Now, she's equating desire with coveting, but they don't have exactly identical usage. There's healthy desire, but not healthy coveting, in ancient, biblical, and modern usage. So we might ask ourselves, what is selfless success? This poem was sent by one of Dr. Laura's listeners from her church bulletin. Success is speaking words of praise and cheering other people's ways, and doing just the best you can with every task and every plan. Success is silence when your speech would hurt, politeness when your neighbor is curt, deafness when the scandal flows, and sympathy with another's woes. Success is courage when disaster falls, patience when hours are long, success is found in laughter and in song, and in the silent time of prayer. In all of life, and nothing less, we find the thing we call success. Dr. Laura also quotes the beautiful Psalm 27 on heavenly treasure. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Dr. Laura's book on the Ten Commandments is surprisingly helpful, and surprising since her competition is not books from the likes of Dr. Phil and Oprah and Joel Osteen, but rather the Church Fathers, the Greco-Roman moral philosophers, and the preachers and scholars over the ages. And why do I think that? Well, first of all, she had the humility to co-author the book with her rabbi, Stuart Vogel. Plus, she has many great practical observations from the many years she did her call-in counseling show on the radio and all over the internet. And although her main audience is stay-at-home moms, I enjoy popping over to her website every once in a while to listen to a few interesting calls. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.